Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. My name is John Holland, and I'm the Chief Development Officer of Pynchon, and I'll be presenting today's webinar uh, from Vancouver. This webinar is part of our Practice Innovation Series, which we hope to highlight today's issues in built and natural environment, combining professional and academic expertise with Pynchon's internal specialists. We started this uh, webinar series spring of last year, focusing on COVID-19, and we're going to continue as more issues and changes in our landscape take place resulting from that this event that we're still living through we have um, over 100 attendees today ranging from universities municipalities municipal engineers owners lenders and developers so it should be wait for some for a good attendee list and a, a lively conversation at the end uh, we've scheduled this for 75 minutes because we found our presentation was a bit longer and we expected a few more questions um, clearly so make, make this work for your own schedules. Um, all of us in this room or in this call likely know that Toronto was the fastest growing city in North America. That's both in absolute and percentage terms, which is impressive since it's not the biggest city. Uh, and that was a study due, made by Ryerson University. So the growth of our urban population seems to be continuing even in a pandemic. And as urban infill development continues, many viable sites involve the reuse of contaminated land. This of course presents unique challenges, but also opportunities for developers and owners to add value to their land and support healthy economic and community development as part of that process. So urban infill, uh, however, the regulatory process and inducements and tax offset opportunities are changing with policy and urban planning direction. So we've assembled our panel of experienced practitioners to highlight some of the key lessons learned and some indications of uh, future direction for this uh, this area. At the end of the presentation, there will be a uh, QR code for you to scan with your phones, come up on the screen for you to give feedback. We present, we're presenting these webinars as a series, and it's our hope that this series will help to highlight changes, and we hope to educate you and educate ourselves to be more ready and available for the uh, changing landscape that's happening. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Next slide, please, Kaylee. Thank you. Oh, a bit of housekeeping, of course, before we do that. First of all, get comfortable. If you could raise your hand uh, just to make sure that our audio is working, you can really hear us. Um, a few Zoom tools that I'm sure a year into this almost you're all painfully aware of. The chat function is for if you're having technical issues, that's how we help resolve that. Um, and if you have technical questions that you'd like answered either during or likely at the end of the webinar, uh, please put them in the Q&A and we'll try to um, We'll try to, to, we will ask them as much as we can given time. And there will be a poll question at the beginning that Biko is going to run through just to help us, you know, um, present this in line with your, uh, your expectate, your, your needs. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce the presenters. My first uh, speaker is Biko Poloski, who is the EVP of the GTA region for Pynchon. He has an environmental management background and, and particularly due diligence and development consulting. Vico will be discussing the regulatory framework and effective tools for managing environmental issues in brownfield developments, the, the broad landscape. Vico specializes in brownfield development, due diligence, environmental assessment and remediation, and environmental risk management. Vico's worked for Pynchon for 15 years, and he holds an honors bachelor of science degree in geology and a master of science in hydrogeology earth sciences. Following Vico, we were going to have Tom Giancos, who is the Senior Vice President of Urban Development for Kingset. Tom will be covering the permitting and entitlement process and strategies in urban development and also present five local case studies he's been involved with directly. Tom has over 20 years experience in a wide variety of environmental development and construction projects throughout the GTA and Canada. Tom holds a degree in urban and regional planning, studying both at Ryerson University and the University of Central England. In lieu of fee for today's presentation, Thomas kindly donated his honorarium to the Canadian Cancer Society. And following Tom will be Ian Andrus, who is a partner and head of the Administrative Law Group at Goodman's. Ian will be discussing the tax incentives and municipal and provincial inducements relevant to urban development. Ian is the head of the firm's Administrative Law Group at Goodman's. His practice focuses on municipal and land development matters for public and private sector clients throughout Ontario. He assists on municipal issues ranging from bylaw interpretation and enforcement to complex planning applications and tax appeals. 
Ian provides advice on development, grant incentives, brownfield remediation programs, municipal financing, expropriation, and a variety of other land development issues. In lieu of a fee, Ian has kindly donated his honorarium to Toronto Sick Kids Hospital. So thank you both for those uh, generous donations and thank you to all of you, our attendees, for being on this webinar today. And uh, with that, I'll pass the podium over to Vico, who can start his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, John. And uh, welcome to Tom and Ian, both of whom I have uh, worked with in the past, and I'm currently working with Tom on a number of projects. Uh, we're just going to do a quick uh, poll. If I could ask that everybody just take tick a box, we're trying to get an idea of where our attendees uh, fit as far as uh, what their role is in this uh, real estate sector. And then I'll get started after we uh, just give you a minute or two to, to click on the poll. Thank you. Okay, so we've got uh, a pretty good cross section, but the majority coming from real estate development investment and from contractors, consultants, architects, planners. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about uh, the development process really from the purely environmental perspective and approach to a record of site condition, which is the regulatory instrument in Ontario for changing land use. Next slide, please, Kaylee. So when I look at um, real estate development, I've kind of simplified it into sort of a three-step process here. Um, starting with due diligence, um, you know, typically, if, and from our perspective, you know, not just the environmental, but the due diligence would involve the, the environmental, there'd be financial, legal, et cetera. Um, from our perspective as consultants, you know, the due diligence typically involves phase one, some, most of the time phase two environmental assessments can include geotech work, um, hazardous material studies for existing buildings, remedial costing, depending on what type of issues may have been identified, et cetera. Um, and, and as I go, I'm gonna talk about some of the sort of lessons learned and little tidbits of information that, that we find helpful when we're following through this process. So for example, I mentioned geotechnical. We often get calls from clients saying, yeah, I included geotech in there, but they have no idea of what they're proposing to build. So if you at least have an idea, it's really helpful as developers to provide that information to us so that we have a little bit better of idea of what where we need to go with the investigation. The next stage of the, of the work is really the site preparation and permitting from the environmental perspective. That's when you get into your um, more detailed investigations, your remediation, perhaps risk assessment, and finally the filing of a record of site condition. Um, and then lastly, we get into stage three, which is the construction. And you know, hopefully at the end of all of that, we come up with a nice new building. Next slide, please. So when is an RSC required? Well, a record of site condition, or the RSC as they're called, is part of Reg 153, and it's required whenever there's a change from a less sensitive to a more sensitive land use. So in the little picture in the middle there, I show you know, a commercial industrial type facility changing to residential, but parkland and institutional are also included in that. And, it, and it's really important to note that mixed use is, as long as there's a residential component, then that change from commercial or industrial to mixed use requires the record of site condition. Even if, for example, um, you've got a large office tower with perhaps some condos just at the top, that's still a more sensitive land use and typically an RSC is required. Um, one of the things that we like to tell our clients is that it's really important to get the city involved early because at the bottom of the slide, you see that I have the however, that municipalities can also require a record of site condition despite no change in land use. And this is often for site plan approval, building permits, uh, conveyances of uh, portions or strips of, of the developable land to the city. And it's really important to know in advance of starting the whole RSC process, whether 
or even the assessment process, whether the RSC is required. So, you know, get involved with your uh, planners, your city people, talk to them, figure out what's required and get to know this as soon as possible. And most importantly, make sure you share this information with your consultant, because what we find is that in some cases we're, we're told that an RSC is needed once the work's already started or the development's already started at a site. And in a lot of cases, that can result in extra time, effort, and costs. Next slide. So the RSC process starts with a phase one ESA. And it's important to note that this is a phase O-N-E phase one. It's different from the standard due diligence or CSA, uh, Canadian Standards Association phase one, in that the regulatory RSC phase one is much more prescriptive. It follows a very predetermined iterative process that the ministry has set up. Um, there's a PCA or a potentially contaminating activity um, is, is an activity, the ministry has a list of 59 of them in total. And for example, dry cleaners, fuel storage or dispensing, including above ground storage tanks or underground storage tanks, vehicle maintenance, soil infilling, manufacturing activities. These are all considered potentially contaminated, sorry, potentially contaminating activities. And if these kind of activities are conducted or were conducted on your site, they automatically generate or result in an area of potential environmental concern. And unfortunately, any APEC that is identified on site must be addressed through a phase two. So, um, you know, whereby in a, in a due diligence phase one, we may identify an above ground storage tank in a building and say, you know, this tank looks fine. Um, it's got spill protection or there's no evidence of spills or leaks or anything. We wouldn't recommend a phase two, but in order to meet the requirements of reg 153 and a record of site condition, it's mandatory to drill a borehole beside that tank. So you can see that there are, there are aspects of the regulatory process that are a lot more stringent and are almost always end up resulting in the requirement for a phase two. The good news is that offsite PCAs, there is a little bit of flexibility on behalf of the qualified pro professional to write off things, A, whether maybe they've been assessed previously or we can use um, opinions such as distance from the site, et cetera but it's somewhat arbitrary and the ministry often questions when we're writing off offsite um, APEX. Next slide, please. So we've done a phase one, we've identified a number of PCAs on the site, perhaps offsite. We've got these APEX that we need to assess. So what do we do? Well, phase twos are generally drilling of boreholes, testing of soil and groundwater. Um, the phase two work is, is you know, we compare those results to the generic standards that the ministries put together, that uh, there's really three criteria that they use. There's the land use, whether groundwater is used as a source of potable water and the soil texture. Is it so uh, medium to fine textured soil such as silts and clays, or is it coarse like sands and gravels? The land uses go back to that sensitive to less sensitive use would be commercial, industrial, uh, are deemed as one group. And then you've got your other group, which is residential, institutional, and parkland. Um, one of the things that's important to note on the phase two side of things is that because of the requirement for full delineation of impacts, both vertically and horizontally, we find particularly at complex or sites with a little bit more contamination than others, that the regulation more or less requires us to do multiple rounds of phase two. So if we do an initial assessment and we say that eight boreholes need to be done, as soon as we start finding impacts, we have to delineate them vertically and horizontally. And sometimes you need to plan after the fact to come back and do more work to do this. So what we try our best to do is to supplement any of the due diligence work that we might have done at a site with the RSC based work after the fact in order to save some costs. Um, in order to file an RSC, you either need a clean phase two, so no soil or groundwater impacts, or if there have been impacts identified, then we're gonna have to go to either remediation or risk assessment. So I often get people asking me saying, well, can I file a 
an RSC on this site because we've got we've done the full investigation, but we have some impacts. You can't do that. The site either needs to meet the generic criteria or meet risk-based criteria. So when we put together these phase twos, we also, as part of the report, put together what's called a conceptual site model. And the CSM, as it known in short, basically provides a picture of the site, the nature of the contaminants that are there, their distribution, cross sections, figures, et cetera. And it's very important to, to ensure that the CSM is as detailed as possible. Um, the ministry often comes back after the fact saying, you know, we'd like to see a little bit more work here or there. As part of our RSC process, we try to do what we feel is sort of the minimum amount of work in order to satisfy the ministry. But the ministry, as I said, often does come back requiring some additional work. So, you know, you, you got to be careful that you don't try and cut corners or, or dial back your scope too much. And obviously, we don't want to spend too much money, but scientists and engineers, we all like lots of data and the ministry likes even more than we do. Another important thing to note about the phase two is that if we've identified an APEC at the site, it doesn't matter what type of accessibility issues or obstructions there may be. In order to satisfy the ministry, in order to put together a full and detailed conceptual site model, you have to be able to drill that location. As an example, uh, we worked on a file where the building was already built there was a brand new underground storage tank on site that had never been used. It was filled up a week before we submitted our conceptual site model to the ministry. And the ministry said, that's a potentially contaminating activity. We had to go back to the site and drill another borehole. The problem was this, this was a building with a 10 foot thick concrete floor slab that was supporting a whole bunch of huge backup generators and the drilling work involved coring through 10 feet of concrete. So you can imagine for one borehole, that was an extremely expensive borehole. The same thing on the same site happened where there happened to be that the caisson wall at the property stuck, was in from the property line a little bit. Um, we didn't realize that when we did the initial phase two work, and then the ministry made us go back and try and drill holes between the caisson wall and the uh, property line and it was difficult because of the nature of the uh, logistics at the site. Next slide. So what is a risk assessment? Because you heard me mention about clean up the site or risk assessment. Well, risk assessment is an, is an environmental process or a process for identifying the hazards and the potential harm they might have to humans or ecological receptors. So the environmental risk assessment is conducted in order to determine if there's health risks to the people the, or the environment from the exposure of specific contaminants or, or chemicals at a site, whether they be in soil, groundwater, or sediment. Um, and as, as the slide shows, there's you know, various different things that could be buried in the ground or have leaked, and, and the contaminants basically are your hazard. They're, they're the contaminant that's whether it's toxic or carcinogenic, then there's the pathway. So how do humans or the environment get exposed? Well, generally it's through inhalation of vapors, ingestion of either contaminated soil or groundwater, or through dermal contact. So the risk assessment is a process to determine the receptor's ability to take up contaminants and the receptors being humans or the environment. Next slide, please. So why not remediate? In a lot of cases, we have properties where the costs of remediation exceed a certain amount. Maybe it's not viable or economically feasible. Um, it can be that, you know, for example, imagine your typical Toronto redevelopment site where there's going to be multiple layers of underground parking. You're going to remove the majority of the soil impacts, but there may be contaminated groundwater that is going to remain or be present deeper than your deepest level of underground. To remediate that groundwater is going to be extremely time consuming and extremely expensive, if not technically impossible. So that's, this is where risk assessment comes into play, where 
sometimes you have to do some remediation, but risk assessment is sort of the path forward in order to, to uh, continue your development. Or imagine a site with a slab on grade building. You've got contaminated soil. You don't need to excavate much soil other than to put in your footings for your building because you don't have underground parking, et cetera. So why would you excavate and remove and, and remediate what could be millions of dollars of soil when risk assessment can be considerably cheaper. So, and there are certain types of contaminants that are not as easily remediated uh, in comparison to like soil impact. So for example, when it comes to groundwater contaminated by chlorinated solvents or volatile organics, it's often not possible to meet the most, the more stringent generic standards. Therefore we go down the risk assessment route. Um, as I've already talked about the depth of the excavation, if the depth of the excavation doesn't go deep enough and you're gonna leave impacts in place, then you go through risk assessment. One of the things that we found, and this is another one of those sort of hints that we talk to clients about, is that if you're unsure that your development is going to be able to remove all of the impacts at a site, what we often do is start the risk assessment early in the RSC process and we can always pull the plug on the risk assessment if the excavation of the site is successful in removing all the soil and groundwater impact. If it's not, well, we've already started the RA, got the ball rolling because the risk assessment process can be very time consuming. Um, a complicated tier three risk assessment can take as much as three years to get passed by the ministry. So, you know, in a development scenario, that can be a long period of time if you're waiting till you're already excavating in order to start your, uh, your risk assessment. Next slide, please. So this little piece here where risk assessment is shown there sort of between the phase two and the remediation, sort of the, what we call sort of the bridge whereby some remediation is almost always done. And then the risk assessment is sort of the polishing off or the way to get the ministry approval. Um, one of the things that we've found is that it's really important to involve the ministry and the city and the various regulatory parties and entities as quickly as you can in the process so that they can approve in principle the approach. Um, the ministry has become a lot more open to discussion during the process. It used to be that we had to submit what's called our pre-submission form to the ministry, which was outlining our risk assessment process and the contaminants that we had at the site. And then they'd come back and basically say, no, we need all this and ask for all kinds more information. What we're finding these days is that if you get the ministry involved early, they can sort of pre-approve in principle the, um, the approach that we're going to do, especially when it comes to complex contaminants and the potential risk management measures that may need to be implemented in order to get the risk assessment um, success or uh, to succeed. Next slide, please. So you've submitted your RSC. You've got your risk assessment done. Where do we go from here? Well, the first thing that's going to happen, particularly if it's a site where risk assessment or significant remediation has been completed, is that you're going to have to file a certificate of property use on the property or the ministry is going to require this. The CPU, as it's known, is it's a legal document that's there to basically enforce the required risk management measures. And I'll talk about risk management measures in a second. So the CPU, it's registered on the title of the land. So therefore it's binding on the future property owners. They're aware of it so that if there are development restrictions or annual inspections or monitoring or some maintenance of equipment or something like that that's required to address the risk management measures or to keep them going, the future building owners or property owners are aware because it's on the title of the land. Typical risk management measures are basically ways to mitigate those pathways that I was talking about. So one of the most common um, risks to humans at contaminated sites is inhalation of vapor. So contaminants migrating through soil gas and accumulating in a building and people inhaling the vapors. So things that mitigate that um, may sound kind of silly, but a ventilated parking garage is considered a risk management measure or membranes present around the building that basically 
although the vapors are there, they're underneath the building, they can't get in. Um, other types of risk management plans include capping um, to basically isolate contaminated soils from ecological receptors such as birds and animals, et cetera, and or humans. So a paved parking lot or a building is actually considered a cap. Um, sometimes you need to do annual indoor air quality monitoring to confirm that the potential vapors from below aren't getting into the building. Sometimes we have to do groundwater control to ensure that groundwater isn't leaving this, the property. So sometimes there's a, maybe a pump and treat system. There may be some type of reactive barrier wall that basically you, you can have contaminated water on your site because your risk management measures such as your parking garage or, or capping, et cetera, are, are um, keeping the occupants of your building safe, but you need to mitigate the risk, risk for potential offsite people. So there's all kinds of different risk management measures that come into play and they're engineered generally into the construction and the development of the new building. So it's really important to work closely with your, your consultant, your structural engineers, your designers, your architects, et cetera, in order to make sure that the appropriate risk management measures get built into the design of your building as you're going through. Next slide, please. So this is just, uh, I mean, don't, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of all the various pathways here, but really the purpose of this slide is to show you that the RSC process, it's complicated. It's iterative, it can go back, you know, there's a few spots where there's a few sort of feedback loops there. Um, the risk assessment process generally goes through a minimum of two reviews with the ministry, and it's generally three. So, you know, it, it's a roundabout process, each review taking as long as 16 weeks. So the, thus that sort of three year time frame. Um, so there's a lot of different things that need to be taken into consideration. At some sites, you may consider filing multiple RSCs in order that if it's a larger development, you can start working on say, the cleaner portion of the site and worry about the three-year risk assessment on the dirtier portion of the site or somewhere where you need to do some remediation. Thus, you can do a phased development through multiple RSCs. Really important to take into consideration conveyance lands. So what does the city require? You know, a lot of, a lot of redevelopments require a, a 10 meter um, wide conveyance to the city or 10, sorry, 10 feet generally, um, but sometimes wider, those conveyance lands often require a record of site condition and the city often won't allow engineered risk management measures. So sometimes you need to remediate that. You don't need to remediate the rest of the site. So these complex projects and the iterative process here really it requires constant communication between consultants, contractors, clients, developers, the regulators, et cetera, regular stakeholder meetings, design meetings. You know, I, I can't stress how important it is to work with it as a team. We've uh, had some issues in the past where you know, our clients have kept everything tight to their chest and haven't shared all the information. And unfortunately that ends up just um, causing duplication of work, um, costing extra time and time is money in the development process. So we try to make sure that we can combine as much work as possible so that we don't duplicate things. Um, it's really important to try and anticipate design changes, changes in scope, and the coordination of the various teams um, and building in and around, like these risk management measures that I was talking about can really vary depending on the nature of the contaminants at the site. And as many of you will know that, you know, our borehole drilling programs are based on pretty small two inch diameter cores of soil. And, you know, we, we extrapolate between boreholes and sometimes boreholes are five, 10, 20 meters apart. And one thing that we've always found is that when you open up the ground, there's often a lot of big surprises. So be prepared for contingencies, um, be prepared for changes in the scope. And uh, as I said, let's communicate as much as we can. That's it for me. I'm gonna pass it over to Tom now, who will talk about some uh, various scenarios that he's been involved with. Thanks.
Hi everyone. I'm trying to start my video, but I'm not having any luck. So I'll just uh, flip through the uh, slide deck. Um, if you can go to the first slide, please. So I've been, so there, there I am. Uh, hi. So I've been involved with, uh, with development in, primarily in Toronto for over 20 years. And I don't think I've ever touched a site that hasn't had some type of contamination, whether it was a small infill townhouse site in Etobicoke or a 70 story uh, tower site in the uh, downtown core. So every time uh, before we purchase a site, we go through a, a pretty intense due diligence process. And that involves working with people like, uh, like Vico to understand uh, what's on the site. And again, if you have a site that's an acre to three acres in size, you do a series of boreholes and you're kind of those results that you get, you're guessing at what type of contamination may be on site. So even though you may go through extensive due diligence, there's always a risk that you might have missed something. And that's just something you have to work into your risk profile or uh, into your uh, performa contingency. Um, and then there's a bunch of other things we're looking at during due diligence. And one of the things we used to look at a lot was, um, if we find contamination, can we clean that contamination so the site is totally clean to generic standards, which means when we sell it, we have nothing on title, <clears throat> or do we risk assess it away? So we've cleaned it to a certain degree and the Ministry of the Environment said it's okay for people to live on that land. And one of the concerns we had when we started going through this uh, in the early 90s and 2000s was we're concerned that people would not wanna live or buy townhomes, condominiums on contaminated land. And what we found is that the market really doesn't care um, as long as the uh, ministry has provided a sign off, which was very interesting. So that response has led us to uh, move away from trying to totally clean a site, which can be very expensive sometimes, to doing more risk assessments. Um, so I'll just, uh, if I can move to the next slide, <clears throat> please. I'm gonna go through a few case examples of specific sites that I've been involved with. So I'm gonna start with uh, South Shore. South Shore is in South Etobicoke. It was a joint venture that I did with uh, Diamond Corp um, a while back. And it was a three acre site along a rail line. It was a former uh, paint manufacturer. And uh, what we found on this site was pretty interesting. So we, we had to, we were concerned with metal contamination coming off of the rail line. And then we were concerned with the things, the chemicals that they use in the paint process. So what we do when we, when, we, when we have these types of sites is we identify areas of potential environmental concern. And so we take the building, we cut it up into pieces and we say in the Southeast corner, there were tanks and we may have solvents or gasoline in those locations. In the Northeast corner, there was a degreasing um, room. We may have solvents in that location. And this kind of uh, influences, us, influences us and targets how we're gonna be dealing with these types of sites. So on this site in South Etobicoke, what was interesting and a first for me was we found uh, contamination in the form of solvents. Uh, we found contamination in the form of uh, gasoline, uh, metals, etc. And what was interesting is we never thought that the large driveway on the site um, would, would be any kind of potential source of contamination. And that ended up being the largest source of contamination because what was happening back in the uh, 20s and 30s is when they, when they were putting asphalt down in uh, South Etobicoke on these, on these uh, commercial properties, they would go to the uh, refineries and they would take a uh, coal slag and then we use coal slag as an asphalt uh, base, as opposed to using crushed stone, which was cheaper, obviously, but created this lasting environment, environmental impact. So that was something that was pretty interesting and unique. And what we found was in certain pockets, they were just dumping it. They would dig holes or pits that were 10 feet by 30 feet. And you just find all this coal slag, which was, which was uh, something challenging to deal with. And another thing on this site, it was a former uh, paint, factory. So when we were actually excavating and remediating, we were digging up layers and layers of paints. So you would actually have a layer of blue paint that was an inch thick and a layer of red paint and a layer of green paint. And this was like you'd have 
uh, square meters of the uh, southwest property that were impacted. So what was happening was instead of getting rid of the paints, they were just pouring them uh, in, you know, out of the uh, out of the the bins and onto the property and just covering them in soil. So you have layers of paint and a layer of soil to cover, then layers of paint and, a, and, a, and an inch and a half or two layers of soil. So this was one of the most challenging sites that we've dealt with. And again, we're dealing with a site that abuts a rail line and you have residential surrounding it. So you're always concerned about offsite uh, migration as well. If you can just flip to the next slide, please. And then this is the same site. And what we ended up doing was building a series of stacked townhouses on a common underground garage. The idea when we first purchased the site was that we would have the garages located above grade, but we ended up excavating so much material um, to get rid of the metal and paint contamination that we said, instead of backfilling it, let's just have one large kind of open cut garage. Uh, and it was just something, the design of the project evolved through the remediation, remediation exercise we were undertaking on site. Um, it was a great project. It's, you know, it, I think it's maybe 10 years, 10 years old and uh, no issues. And that site was clean to generic standards, which mean we, we, means we had no, uh, nothing on title that ever noted there was any type of contamination. We can go to the next slide. So this is another site in South Etobicoke. It was an infamous site that was around for years. And uh, a lot of people were looking at this site from the late nineties. We ended up doing this project with, again, it was Diamond Corp and Kilmer who we, uh, who we purchased the site from. And Kilmer was running the lion's share of the remediation at the time. And what you had was a standard um, old Etobicoke industrial plant, 245,000 square feet with frontage onto Lake Shore. Uh, to the east of it, you had uh, an oil refinery, um, a small oil refinery that's still in existence. And then you had a, a car dealership, which is currently being remediated uh, and, and is owned by uh, the same company that developed this site, which is Minto at the time. So 245,000 square feet, large 10 acre site, um, a lot of contamination on this site. We were dealing with heavy metals, uh, volatile organics in the groundwater, solvents, gasoline, there was everything. So what we ended up doing was with the consultant is we went through a series of uh, a sampling program then we identified where all of these areas of contamination were and we broke this 10 acre site into quadrants so that we can focus remediation efforts in those quadrants. And again, Kilmer um, ran, it's a Brownfield Fund and they ran a lot of that uh, remediation exercise experts uh, in, in the city and in the province in doing this type of work. And so what you see on the right-hand side is just the extent of the, uh, of the excavation. That excavation is maybe 20, 25 feet deep in some areas. Uh, if you can just uh, flip to the next slide, please. And so on this site, we cleaned some of the sites. So we, we got rid of all the contamination, but in certain areas, we did not get rid of all the contamination. So we went through a risk assessment and that involved remediation, but not to totally clean it, but to bring the contamination levels down to a certain point uh, where the Ministry of the Environment would accept a risk assessment. So the site wasn't totally clean. There's contamination left in the ground and then we went through a series of risk mitigation measures and we implemented certain things on site to mitigate that risk. And what Vico spoke to was, you're not so much concerned, you're, you're typically not concerned with people touching the contamination because it's underground. You're most concerned with how those vapors uh, transfer to the air above grade. So on this site here, you had areas that were clean to generic standards, totally clean. And then you had areas that were still contaminated. And what we did here again was stack townhouse project. And we designed the site with no at space living um, area. So at grade, you had a garage. And what this does is it, it creates a barrier between the living space above and the garage below. The garage below is in contact with the contaminated material. And again, creates a type of barrier.
And these are two uh, visual representations of the site. The site's built fully occupied. And what we're also dealing with is the garage provided a physical barrier for the interior of the units. Then we need to deal with how do you um, protect the open spaces or the outdoor areas. And what we had to do was you had contamination in place, then we provide a fill, a fill cap of clean fill on top of that area, then you plant on top of that. So there's this whole complicated exercise that we went through during the remediation process, which took uh, two to three years, uh, including the RA process. Then after that, that actually informed how we can build, what we can build. Um, so the end product is often tied to how you clean the site up or how you choose to remediate the site. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. So another site that we're currently involved with at King Set is 1319 Bloor Street West. Um, and this is in the west end of the city. Again, another interesting site where we have an active rail line along the perimeter of the site. Um, and we have uh, an, an essentially an agreement in place with uh, Go Transit or Metrolinx to have a station on site and they would take uh, 10 meters of land abutting the station. So you have to deal with the requirements of Metrolinx in terms of how they buy land, what type of contamination they're willing to accept, will accept what type of risk they're willing to accept. Um, and when we purchased this site, again, we went through an extensive due diligence with Pynchon and you have on the right hand side, that's just a map of the site. You have the existing building and then we just surround the site and the building with holes and then pinch in and our, ourselves, we take a guess, uh, best uh, guess as to what type of contamination there is, where it is, where it's going, what the extent of it is. And what you see is you can never cover an entire site. That, so there's always a bit of risk involved with these types of sites. Um, if we can just flip to the next slide. So this is the same property. What we're looking at doing on this property is two towers on a common podium. You have the, uh, the rail line uh, along the, uh, the, the left-hand side of the first image. Um, 10 meters would be dedicated to Metrolinx. They would own that. Um, you'd have an underground parking garage. The construction of the underground parking garage would essentially allow us to remediate all of the contamination we found on site. So again, when you, when you do these large urban sites and you have these large deep garages, you have to excavate for the garage. So you're getting rid of the contamination and what you're trying to figure out when you're running your performance is what is the incremental cost of dumping contaminated soil? Cause your excavation costs are fixed. Your trucking costs are typically fixed but the cost to get rid of contaminated soil versus clean soil, there, there's an incremental difference. So you kind of work that into the performa. And again, on these urban sites, they become a lot more complicated. And on this site in particular, we have a site where we have excavation under our two buildings, but we also have a public park that we're dedicating. So not only are we dealing with the Ministry of the Environment and all of their conditions, we're dealing with the City of Toronto. And the City of Toronto has a separate peer review process from the Ministry of the Environment. And so any lands that we dedicate to the city, they'll look at the record of site condition that we undertake with our consultant and submit to the ministry. But we have to go through another uh, pretty involved process with the uh, city's peer reviewer so that what we're dedicating to them, they're satisfied that it's clean and it meets their, their standards. Uh, next slide, please. So this is another interesting site. Um, that I finished at Kingset a few years back. It's 37 Yorkville. So it's in the downtown, it's right in Yorkville and it's a former TPA garage. Um, so there's a parking authority garage is currently uh, demolished and there's a, right now there's an excavation pit there. And it was interesting because what we did with the Toronto Parking Authority is we actually purchased air rights. We didn't purchase the entire site. So when you think of buying a site, you think of buying it in its entirety, meaning everything below grade and above grade. On this site here, all we did was buy air rights. So from ground up, we owned. From ground below, uh, the Toronto Parking Authority would continue to own. And we had an interesting situation with the Ministry of the Environment because we needed to get a record of site condition 
for the air rights that we own. And the problem is you can't sample air rights. There's no soil, there's no groundwater. And we had to go through a series of meetings and consultations with the ministry to get them to figure out how they can accept a record of site condition for air. And what we ended up, or where we ended up landing on or landing at was they accepted the data or the soils and groundwater results that we got for the site below and applied them to the air rights above. So again, as the city of Toronto expands and grows and land becomes more of a limited resource, we're starting to see these deals where you don't even buy land, you just buy air. And it's something that they've been doing in New York for a long time. And it's starting to happen more and more in the city of Toronto. In Kings that we have another site directly south of this property, and it's the same situation. We own air rights. We own 30 feet above grade. The city of Toronto owns everything below grade. And we're going through the same process because the site to the south, we have another layer of complication where we own the air, the city owns 30 feet below, and then there's a subway below that. And we're trying to work through them, work through how we get an RC with the Ministry of the Environment because you can't actually sample anything below because you have an active subway running running through uh, east and west. So again, these sites become more and more complicated and more and more challenging as, as we move forward. Um, next slide, please. And I'm done. I'm just going to hand it off to Ian. That's great. Thanks very much, Tom. And, and thanks uh, very much to Vico and John and the folks at Pynchon for this opportunity. Um, so, Kelly, if you could go to the first slide, I'm going to start with just some very basic first principle concepts that may not always be top of mind to everyone. I'm sure you're all attuned to the benefits that flow to an individual landowner from remediating uh, its property, but there are also significant public benefits that can flow out of remediation, and, and these range from environmental benefits, social benefits, economic benefits. Cleaning up contaminated lands can really be a catalyst to rejuvenating a broader area and can boost property values in a broader area and stimulate other reinvestment. But as everyone knows, public funds are limited. So one of the challenges, unless the municipality has a direct interest in the lands themselves, it's hard to make brownfield remediation a priority in any given instance. Uh, so both Tom and Vico spoke of some of the, the balancing of costs and viability considerations that landowners and developers go through when deciding whether to remediate a site or risk assess a site. And Tom also spoke to liability issues and that might flow from offsite migration of contaminants and the like. So there's lots of really complicated uh, pro forma and site specific cost and risk challenges involved. And in order to unlock the, the latent public benefits that I mentioned a moment ago, you really need to find a way to make the numbers work for the individual landowner. So next slide, please. Uh, so about 20 years ago or so, the government started to really uh, give some serious thought to this dilemma and, and try to find ways to come up with a financial incentive framework to assist with these complex challenges to advance economic development objectives. And one of the concepts that started to gain some traction was the notion of tax increment financing, which you may or may not be familiar with. And put very simply, what it is, it's a funding mechanism, usually described uh, with reference to public infrastructure or remediation projects. And the idea is that the municipality or the funding authority borrows against projected future gains in property tax revenue, which would be expected to occur as a direct result of the project. So in theory, the notion of TIF is supposed to be a win-win. It's supposed to make use of funds that would not otherwise be accessible or available. And it's, it's conceived of as an effective way of, of kickstarting a project in order to leverage future value uplifts. Uh, next slide, please. So, just like the air rights phenomenon that Tom just spoke about, the, the notion of TIF uh, has been around for quite some time and, and implemented over several decades in other jurisdictions. Many large US cities have used tax increment financing for quite some time. Uh, one example I've mentioned here on the slides is the Hudson Yards development in New York City, uh, which uh, tax increment financing was a, a very important component of the the financial uh, makeup of that project. There's other jurisdictions such as California, which have started to take a step back from using TIF. And there's a real healthy academic debate about uh, whether from a policy perspective and a public benefit perspective, TIF is really all it's made out to be. Uh, there's, there's lots of arguments on both sides of the ledger. Some feel it's difficult to accurately determine whether the projects would have occurred with or without the financial assistance. So uh, if, if the 
if the conclusion is that they would not have occurred, then you know why are they be, being given a tax break or given other public uh, funds to assist them? And there's also some who argue that the benefits themselves are a myth and that there's other government trade-offs and compromises that are sort of embedded in these TIF projects that aren't always known or not always in the on the front line. So it's somewhat of a controversial uh, concept, but the Ontario government 15 years ago did pass legislation called the Tax Increment Financing Act, which was intended to, to put TIF into practice in Ontario. It was initially conceived of for public sector remediation projects and infrastructure projects. There were a couple of pilot projects uh, cited in the original incarnation of it, but in order to actually have the legislation put into practice, the government was supposed to issue an implementing regulation setting out the specific details and requirements as to how the, the funding mechanism would work and where the geographic boundaries would be drawn. And that never actually happened. The government has not ever issued that regulation. So although the legislation is still in the books, it's never really been used. And uh, when Mayor Tory was first elected, uh, I'm sure you all know, you know, he campaigned in part on the Smart Track platform, which was uh, one idea was to use TIF as a way of financing that. And to this day, that's never really come to fruition. Uh, next slide, please. So around the same time for the private sector, the government also brought in a new remediation financing tool and it was part of the Places to Grow initiative. And I'm going to spend some time talking about this today because it's, it's also still uh, operational. So back in 2004, the government allocated $5 million, the provincial government, $5 million annually for provincial tax assistance, which was to be used in connection with the rehabilitation of brownfields. And the objective here was to attract third party funding. It was meant to provide uh, tax assistance at the outset of a process, not necessarily as a TIF scheme, um, but intended to provide some financial breaks early on so that developers could actually move forward with remediation and, and you know, be given some relief from the otherwise onerous costs that might exist at the outset of the process. Um, but there were no guarantees. The provincial, although $5 million was allocated, provincial assistance was always left to the discretion of the Minister of Finance to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. And as a prerequisite to even considering whether the provincial assistance would flow, municipalities had to sign on first and they had to go through a process uh, to confirm that municipal tax assistance would be provided. So I will get into a little bit of that in a moment. Um, but one of the reasons why the, the program has never really rolled out the way it was intended to provide this early tax relief is that governments are not necessarily comfortable canceling taxes early in the process until they're more certain that the actual remediation work is going to be done. Uh, I think there was some concern that developers would start the process and perhaps capitalize on the tax break and then not finish, not actually remediate the lands or redevelop the land. So there was some trepidation around that. And the other part of the, the problem was that early tax relief wasn't necessarily the most lucrative or the most effective way of providing relief because at the stage of land being contaminated pre-remediation, the land value is still quite low, uh, generally speaking. So uh, I think it was realized early on that there's more value to be had through uh, a tax increment financing scheme where the actual tax cancellation occurs later in the process once the value uplift has already been realized. Uh, next slide, please. So that idea started to gain more traction. And today we've got a legislative framework, um, which I've just put on the slide here, not to get into the weeds of it, but because it's important for the fundamental principles it represents. So there's three different uh, concepts here and really three pieces of legislation which govern the Planning Act, uh, which applies to all of Ontario. And then the City of Toronto Act applies just to Toronto, of course, and the Municipal Act applies to every other municipality in Ontario. And those two pieces of legislation are, are basically mirror images of each other in many ways. But the concepts here uh, are, first of all, there's a you know, recognition in the anti-bonusing provisions that municipalities are not allowed to assist commercial enterprise by giving handouts or favorable treatment or financial assistance. And as a way to get around that to deal with the, the brownfield remediation issue, the notion of community improvement plans was put in place in the planning. Act. That's actually been there for quite some time, but it's now been linked to this idea of, of remediation. And if we go to the next slide, I can perhaps explain just quickly a little bit better. So I've already mentioned municipalities are prohibited from financially assisting commercial enterprises. If a community improvement plan is passed though, there, there's a statutory exemption that gets engaged. So 
this is the way that the anti-bonusing rule has, has been sort of reconciled with the notion of providing tax assistance. Municipalities must first, uh, as a first step, actually adopt enabling official plan policies. So every municipality has to have an official plan and within it, uh, in order to, to uh, utilize the community improvement policy uh, legislative framework, they have to have policies in the official plan, which enables the use of that tool. After that's been done, municipalities have to pass a community improvement plan bylaw area and, and basically study to decide for themselves, you know, what policy should be put in place to unlock these public benefits and, and draw boundaries around geographic areas to determine, you know, where improvements needed and what is needed to get to make that happen. Some municipalities for brownfield remediation do this on a holistic approach and will draw a boundary around the whole municipality. Uh, others will will just focus on specific areas that may have you know a long history of contamination or blight. And whatever whatever the decision is at a policy level, municipalities then have to prepare a draft community improvement plan. It gets circulated and posted much like an official plan would, and there's a public review and consultation period. And there are appeal rights as well, uh, historically to the OMB, now to the local planning appeal tribunal. Uh, but once finally adopted, once a community improvement plan is in place, that's where the statutory exemption kicks in. And at that point, the planning act says that a municipality is entitled to make grants or loans to pay for eligible costs and, and to reimburse landowners and developers for eligible costs related to remediation and development. And a couple of important caveats, the financial assistance can never exceed the actual eligible costs that were spent and the financial assistance must also flow in conformity with the CIP policies that have been developed and embedded. Uh, next slide. So specifically for the Brownfield Tax Incentive Program, uh, in order for a property to be eligible for a tax incentive, it must be within an enforced municipal CIP. That's a, a basic prerequisite right in the legislation. And it also must have a phase two ESA completed, which confirms that the property does not meet the standards to permit a record of site condition to be filed. So those are the two basic eligibility requirements. And assuming your property is eligible, then tax assistance becomes available to reimburse the owner for eligible costs undertaken to reduce the concentration of contaminants to permit an RSC to be filed in the registry. Again, not to exceed the actual costs incurred. So this is a bit of a wordy slide, but I put that second bullet up there for good reason, because this is taken right out of the definition of the legislation. And the notion that eligible costs are those to reduce the contaminants to permit an RSC to be filed uh, becomes somewhat interesting because as you'll hear me talk a little more about, in not all cases is an RSC actually required under the Brownfield regulation. So you heard Vico's uh, lay out the process for requiring an RSC for more sensitive land uses, but if you're sticking with a commercial or an industrial land use, an RSC may not be required and therefore it, it, you know, it's an open question as to whether in order to take advantage of the tax incentives, you actually have to go that extra mile and, and file the RSC or whether it's sufficient to just remediate the land to allow the, the commercial use to proceed. Um, so there's a bit of process on this slide as well. I won't spend much time on that. Uh, perhaps we can just go to the next slide, but essentially a municipality has to come up with a draft bylaw and, and run it by the Minister of Finance for approval before it can be passed and taxes can't be canceled until that happens. And I guess the other important part there is it's, it's only when the municipality is about to pass its tax cancellation bylaw that the Minister of Finance is given an opportunity to weigh in as to whether the province will match the tax assistance, the education uh, tax cancellation. And I'll come back to some of the challenges with that in a moment. Um, but it's, you know, the, the minister can either do nothing and the, and the municipality is still entitled to cancel the municipal taxes or the minister can say that the province will also match in which case the municipal bylaw would provide for the canceling of education taxes as well. Um, there's other financial assistance that can be provided through a CIP. It's not all about uh, TIF or cancel taxes. Municipalities are empowered to provide environmental study grant money. Uh, they're empowered to exempt or provide reductions of planning application fees, building permit fees, DCs, in some cases, parkland requirements, and in some cases also grants or loans are available. So uh, initially there was, you know, a pretty quick take up of these, this, this toolkit, I guess, of financial incentives, uh, especially by those municipalities that have a history of a lot of heavy industrial use. So places like Kingston and Cornwall and Hamilton and Welland and Windsor 
they were all quick to pass CIP bylaws to, to unlock some of these economic development objectives. Uh, by 2010, I think there was a, over 40 municipalities in Ontario had plans in place. By 2015, it was over 50. I don't actually have a stat for how many uh, municipalities have these programs today, but uh, more and more of them do, and certainly many of them in the GTA do. Not all though, um, to my knowledge, Mississauga does not have a, a community improvement plan to provide for the same type of tax incentives that Toronto does and some of the other municipalities, which isn't to say that Mississauga is not interested in remediating brownfields, but there's other ways it goes about it through planning policy and, and whatnot. So um, it is meant to be a flexible toolkit uh, with, you know, within some legislative constraints and the take up has been pretty good over the last little while. Um, so I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking about some of the larger municipalities and, and their uh, the programs they have in place. And then I'll just close with some of the challenges that uh, developers face with this type of tax incentive. So Toronto, which is the program I'm most familiar with, have been involved in many applications in Toronto for uh, brownfield remediation and for tax increment grants. Uh, so currently there's, there's still three separate CIP bylaws on the books in Toronto that were passed back in 2012. One of them is called the citywide bylaw because it applies to virtually all of the city, but then there are two area specific bylaws as well that apply to the employment lands south of Eastern Avenue, as well as the, the port lands. Um, or the waterfront lands, I guess. Uh, in 2018, Toronto City Council actually adopted a new CIP bylaw, which would replace and repeal the three that are currently on the books. But the 2018 version is actually not yet enforced. It remains under appeal at the local planning appeal tribunal. So until that, those appeals are finally resolved, the 2012 bylaws are still there. So the Toronto program includes both brownfield tax assistance as well as tax increment grants. Uh, Interestingly and importantly in Toronto, in order to be eligible, a property must be developed for an employment use. So for any remediation project involving residential uses, you know, such as some of the ones that Tom just referenced, there would not be uh, tax incentives available under the CIP program. Next slide. Uh, just a few sort of quick facts about how the Toronto program works. Um, applications have to be submitted before the first above grade permit is issued. So lots of time uh, to actually get the application in and you know really all the way up until the, the building is ready to come out of the ground um, but there are some important timing considerations which i'll get to in a moment the way the brownfield assistance works is that in toronto it's available for two to three years after the development is completed and what that means is that the taxes that will be cancelled are the up the increased taxes uh, flowing out of the redeveloped site redevelop for employment uses and until you actually reach your actual level of costs incurred you can have the taxes cancel for up to three years afterwards so uh, i've been involved in projects where this amounts to millions of dollars of recovery uh, provided that that much money has been spent on remediation there's one project i worked on recently with vico where uh, 12 or 13 million dollars was spent in, in remediating the site and uh, because the tax uplift from the redevelopment didn't actually uh, reach that amount. The, the developer was only able to recover about two thirds of that, but nevertheless, it was still a seven or $8 million uh, recovery from the remediation costs. But going back to what I said a few moments ago, this wasn't upfront money. This is money that the developer had to wait for until the building was, was finished and occupied and reassessed by MPAC, because it's only at that point that the actual value uplift can be determined. Uh, in addition to the Brownfield, there's also the development grant or the Teague uh, aspect of it in Toronto where an additional 10 years of, of tax increment financing is available and again it can't exceed actual construction costs but on a complex Toronto development you know obviously that construction cost can easily be into the tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars and the one there's a couple interesting timing points which I should just quickly make here the current bylaws that are enforced in Toronto the 2012 bylaws only permit recovery of of eligible remediation costs that are incurred after the city has passed its tax cancellation bylaw. So although you don't have to apply for the, the, the incentive until your above grade permit is issued, if you've already done all the remediation work and you haven't applied yet, and therefore the city hasn't passed the tax cancellation bylaw, under the current, current rules, you're actually not eligible for recovering those costs. So that's a pretty big problem. Uh, the, new, the new bylaw that's passed in 2018 uh, would rectify that problem. And so hopefully at least that portion of the bylaw takes effect soon uh, because there the eligible remediation costs include those incurred up to a full year before the application was submitted. 
So one big takeaway for, for any landowners or developers on the line here who have uh, contaminated sites are looking to redevelop and take advantage of this incentive in Toronto. The, you know, the remediation costs, it, it, the, the bottom line is you should get the application in as soon as possible to the city because the sooner it's in, you know, the, the more remediation costs will be eligible for recovery. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'm just, I don't have a lot of time left here. So just gonna very quickly go through the next few slides. And it's really just a comparative exercise. Ottawa's had a brownfield redevelopment program on the books for quite some time. It's similar to Toronto's program in a lot of ways, except that it was recently amended to cap the development grants at only five years of recovery. Although the overall tax increase that can be recovered is a little bit higher than Toronto, but it's only for five years. Um, like Toronto taxes can actually be canceled for the remediation component for up to three years. And unlike Toronto, Ottawa's program provides for recovery for even residential projects. So a little more flexibility there. And Ottawa's pr uh, program also includes some of the other menu items from the toolkit that I mentioned. So um, development charge reductions, building permit free fee grants are available. Uh, so anyone who has property in Ottawa should certainly look into this program and, and see what all the eligibility requirements are. Uh, next slide. Hamilton has also had a program on the books for quite some time. The uh, Environmental Remediation and Site Enhancement Program, known as ERASE, um, is, is a pretty lucrative means of recovering for remediation efforts. Uh, so it's a recovery of up to 80% of the municipal tax increase for up to 10 years. And this one does require the submission of an RSC that's written right into the bylaw. Uh, there's also a tax increment grant program which provides additional recovery up to five years, not to exceed actual costs. So Hamilton has several uh, menu items available as well, also DC reductions and the like. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not purporting to, to explain every last detail of these project, of these programs or, or necessarily capture all of the uh, specific incentives available, but suffice it to say that Hamilton has a, a robust and comprehensive program as well. Next slide. And then just quickly, two more upper tier municipalities have had programs in place for quite some time. So Waterloo Region, where I've done a fair bit of work, has a a two-tier brownfield financial incentive program in place. So with its urban municipalities, Kitchener, Cambridge, and Waterloo, uh, the region has a joint uh, brownfield financial incentive program and, and tax increment grant program. There's exemptions from regional DCs available, in some cases also local DCs, depending where the property is located. And similar to the other programs I've just mentioned, there's tax grants available for up to 10 years based on a TIF model. And then finally, if we go to the, the last slide, the Niagara region, uh, has a similar program in place. Uh, again, in partnership with the lower tier municipalities, it's a matching program in Niagara. Niagara has actually done it through what's called their Smarter Niagara Initiative, as opposed to passing an upper tier community improvement plan. Um, but because it's a matching project with the lower tiers who have to have CIPs in place, that still works uh, from the legislative framework. So again, there's, there's good money available for um, tax increment grants for up to 10 years uh, following development. Uh, next slides. So I just wanted to end with uh, some issues that have arisen in my practice and, and speaking with, with colleagues and, and clients over the years. Um, so there's four issues I'll quickly speak to. The first is inconsistent participation and response time from the province. So I started by explaining how this was really a provincial initiative 15, 20 years ago to bring these tax incentives into place. And although the province set up the legislation and, and still today uh, entertains applications for matching tax assistance. In my experience, in, in many, if not most cases, the minister doesn't actually do anything with those applications. So the way it works, it's not a direct application from the landowner to the province. The municipality has to take in the application on behalf of the owner and then actually file the application to the province in order to uh, have the matching education tax cancellation considered. And often those applications are just ignored. I, the project that I worked on with Vico was actually one of the few that has received a favorable response from the province and, and ended up, you know, resulting in an extra three million or so in uh, tax cancellation for that landowner. But there were some pretty unique circumstances associated with that project, which are not replicable in most cases. And therefore, you know, it, I, the takeaway really is that you shouldn't count on the province contributing or, or matching with its share of the education tax assistance because it's primarily been a municipal uh, program in terms of implementation. The second issue I've got here is how should proof of remediation be demonstrated? So 
this ties back to what I said towards the outset of my presentation. Um, the legislation itself, in order to, in, in describing eligible costs, says you can recover for the cost to reduce the contaminants to permit an RSC to be filed. But it doesn't go that next step and say, you must file an RSC in order to get the tax assistance. Many municipal programs do go that next step and require the RSC, but it's, it's a bit of an open question as to how necessary or appropriate that is because there are projects, and especially in Toronto where only employment uh, redevelopment projects are eligible for this tax relief. Many, if not all of those would not require an RSC as part of the, the actual um, brownfield regulation process. And yet in order to unlock this financial benefit, they do have to do an RSC. So the project that I worked on with Vico again, we were in this unusual situation where the remediation was complete long ago. The building had been fully constructed and occupied and reassessed. And at that point, the RSC still had not been completed because all the technical requirements of the ministry had not yet been satisfied on this, this very uh, unique and very contaminated property. And so even though the, the building was up and running, the RSC had not been filed yet. And it, it became a real quandary as to when the tax assistance would actually be provided. We've, we ultimately did resolve the, the issue, but it was complicated. Uh, next slide. And then two other final points. It's important to know that the provincial brownfield financial tax incentive uh, program guide actually includes a specific restriction on conveyance and assignment. So the theory here is that the government wants to know who it's dealing with and who it's entering into a contract with to provide this, this incentive. So the government doesn't want it to automatically be assignable or, or to roll over to a new owner. Um, but again, if the, the problem I described in the previous issue, if the remediation work was completed long ago and and the building's up and running and the owner decides they want to sell the, the property, you know, why shouldn't that be allowed? You don't, it, it doesn't address the, the issue that was initially conceived of that the government doesn't know who it's dealing with because the remediation work has been completed. So at that point, the money should flow. And just because the technical requirements have not yet been satisfied to allow the money to flow, you know, it's, it's an open question again, whether it's reasonable that the, uh, the no conveyance or no assignment clause needs to be in there and, and be enforced strictly. Finally, there's timing issues sometimes based on the, the way the rehabilitation and development periods are defined in the bylaw. I haven't really went into this in any detail, but the way the legislation is set up and the way municipal bylaws are usually drafted, it, it defines a rehabilitation period as the 18 month period starting on the day the tax cancellation bylaws is enacted. And then the development period kicks in after that 18 month period and goes for a defined period of time, which in theory is meant to be the, the time that the the building is actually developed. Now the province limits the development period to 18 months. So that 18 and 18, the province will only ever uh, reimburse for up to three years. Municipalities are actually allowed to go beyond the 18 month development period if they choose to. Um, Toronto's bylaw is also capped at a three year overall recovery, but there's other municipalities that have as much as five years of tax cancellation allowed. Uh, but the way, going back to my point about when the eligible costs kick in relative to when the bylaws pass, sometimes these, these periods don't really work because the rehabilitation or the remediation work may have been completed long ago and yet the bylaw had not be passed yet. So then when the bylaws pass, you're all of a sudden into this rehabilitation period, even though the building may already be occupied. So it's a bit, it's a bit cumbersome and, and um, convoluted how they've defined some of these things. They can usually be worked through and municipalities, in my experience, usually um, are, are happy to um, adhere to the spirit of the tax assistance and don't necessarily get hung up on these definitions, but there can be complications. So certainly if you're going through one of these projects, it's important to be mindful of all that. So I think I'm probably up to time. So that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Vico. Great presentations. Um, maybe I'd ask you all to uh, unmute and open your video. There is a couple of questions I've got a bit of time for. First one, um, oh, we would like your feedback, of course. You could scan this QR code. That's a more efficient way of giving feedback, like menus and restaurants. Uh, and we, you know, we do more of these. We want to do more of these based on the feedback you give us. So please give us your honest feedback on how you like this and maybe suggestions for future webinars. Question maybe primarily for Vico, but I'll ask Ian and Tom to jump in. In the event that an owner decides to voluntarily file a risk assessment in the process of an RSC, where the RSC is not necessarily for zoning purposes, i.e. land doesn't change use or something more sensitive, 
Has the ministry ever forced owners to remediate their site in the past in that situation? I just start with you, Vico. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, generally, no. Um, however, uh, I mean, the, the whole issue of filing an RSC when the RSC is not required. I mean, Ian brought it up and, and it, this project, specific project that, that Ian and I were involved in, you know, there was no requirement for the RSC. This project took much longer to actually complete the RA, get the RSC filed than we had ever anticipated, partly because this was during the period when the ministry changed the regulations, um, but also, we have gotten pushback in the past from the ministry um, internally saying, if there's no change in land use, why would you file a record of site condition? But Ian just gave you a hundred really good reasons and millions of dollars worth of reasons why on a non-regulatory requirement, why is totally prudent and in some cases mandatory, for example, in Hamilton and uh, some of the other regions. So we haven't seen the ministry force the owners to remediate, but we have seen delays in those non-regulatory requirement sites to get that RSC passed. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, and it's for Tom primarily on the South Shore Tobico project. Yeah, I think you suggested that when the contamination degree became evident, you redesigned the structure to make the parking an intermediate zone for separation. Was that, a, was that always a concept? Was that a complete pivot in the middle of the design process? Or and did you lose time in that and possibly cost in that process? Yeah, I think we were going back and forth with whether or not to have the parking fully underground, partially underground. Um, and when we went through the mediation exercise, we actually made the decision to have uh, like a standard one level underground garage. So we're on the fence and the remediation exercise pushed us towards a more traditional one level parking garage. Thank you. Uh, and to add, uh, sorry, I'd like to add yeah. just a bit to that. I mean, not specific to that project, but to several that, that we've been involved with where the degree of contamination or the depth of contamination has often changed or caused changes in the actual design of the structures. I mean, there's one project we're involved in right now where groundwater is extremely deep. Um, but there's going to be multiple levels of underground parking and trying to determine, you know, what type of building, what number of levels of underground was, you know, dependent on both the depth of the groundwater and the degree of contamination of the groundwater and the cost of the potential risk management measures that might be associated with the deeper garages. Thank you. Uh, just a confirmation, a couple of questions have come in. Will we be sharing this presentation? Yes, it will be posted on our website in the next few days, so please stay tuned for that. Ian, a question for you on uh, the inducements and tax incentives. Have there been situations in your professional practice where you've seen these uh, projects become gone from non-viable to viable based on the inducements and tax incentives, or are they just a, a nice to have rather than a deal enabler? No, I, I think certainly uh, the tax incentives have been critical to unlocking the viability of some projects. I mean, as, as legal counsel, I'm not necessarily, uh, I don't necessarily see the pro formas of our clients and, and know, you know firsthand what the ins and outs of that are, but certainly anecdotally, I've heard many, many times that, you know, the ability to recover, you know, in some cases, just speaking of the Toronto program alone, if, if you're redeveloping the site and you're remediating it, you can get up to 12 years of your, your tax increment back. That can be as much as, um, well, if you're in an employment area in Toronto, that can be as much as 77% of the cumulative tax increment over that 12 year period. So, you know, if the value of the property is increasing by tens of millions of dollars, you get 77% of that back times 12, you know, it's, it's the recovery can be into the tens of millions of dollars. So certainly that's a, a very significant, if not absolutely critical uh, line item on a, a project. Thank you. Ian, um, I had a question when you were talking about the um, Brita tax uh, piece in, in the city and how it only applies to employment lands. 
has there ever been any, like, for example, a lot of the newer, call it employment land developments that have like a minimal amount of, say, residential at the top, very absolute top of, say, a, an office tower that is predominantly office with a commercial podium. So generally employment lands, might they qualify or a portion of the site qualify in the future? I mean, anything's possible in the future, I suppose, if Toronto changes the bylaw, but no, residential use is never qualified Toronto. So that doesn't mean the project itself wouldn't qualify. It means that the GFA associated with the residential uses would be carved out of the, the equation. Okay. That, that was really more retail was... uses at the base of a podium are typically excluded as well. Um, I've been in debates with the city about whether in a, in a typical office building, whether the ground floor elevator lobby space uh, should be included within the the uh, calculation as well. And, and that also actually engages the development charge exemption issue because in Toronto where uh, non-residential development charges were only charged on the ground floor space and where the bylaw said that if you're eligible for the, the IMIT program, you're to get exempt from the development charges, there became a question of whether, uh, you know, whether the there should be a DC exemption and whether you should get IMIT grants for that space. So, um, you know, the, there's some, the way Toronto has written its bylaws is not exactly clear in some of those instances, but the intent is really just to allow recovery for employment uses and not retail uses and not residential. Okay. Okay. Well, I think uh, hearing no more questions, I think I'm going to close it there. Uh, above all, I'd like to thank all my speakers for a great presentation, very interactive and very informative. I'd like to thank Kaylee and Jose in the background who make these webinars go so seamlessly. Thank you to you two. And thank you to our audience. Your participation encourages us to keep doing this and share our experience with all of you. And as I stressed at the beginning or told you, I ask you, please share your experience and recommendations because we get this feedback from you and we try and give you our feedback through these webinars as part of our service to the community as we go through this pandemic together. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you all, wish you well, a good and safe day, and stay tuned for future webinars. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thank Ian. Thanks, thanks, thanks Tom, Thank Kaylee. That was great. Good day. job.